Okay, okay, sorry. Thank you, thank you everyone for bearing with me. All right, now we are recording. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to the second guest speaker session. This is Kaylin Searles. And um, let me introduce her briefly and then we'll, I guess we'll make those announcements at the end. So, uh, Ms. Searles is a skilled UT Arlington student who has found an exceptional way to balance her personal, professional, and academic life. Uh, serving as student government president, Caitlin has helped organize campus programs, events, and operations while also maintaining high marks in college and building her professional career in government and local politics. Caitlin Searles is an alumnus of Tarrant County College and is currently pursuing a double major in public relations and English from UTA. So, Caitlin, welcome. Thank you again for being here. So, so let's let's just get right into it and kind of jump off the conversation we were just having. So, I'm assuming you don't have any off days, yes? Um, you know what? No, not really. I'm, I have off afternoons. Occasionally I have off mid mornings. So you kind of just have to grab time in between, but no, I don't really have any, any off days. I, I don't know what that word means anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like that triangle in college where it's like, uh, you have to pick two. It's like friends, grades, work, you know, yes. and it's like, you can't have all three. No, um, yeah. <laughs> well, we will explore as we go, whether or not we can we take that framework as true or not, but, but yeah, I, obviously something has to give. And in this case, it would be, you know, time to watch like the alienist on HBO max or something, you know? Yeah. 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 Definitely balance. Balance is important. I'm sure we're going to talk about that more and I'm really excited too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so could you give any preliminary kind of insights on what it means to balance what that would look like and how you do it? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest part of that is having a having having boundaries and having a, a work life balance that you can keep up with. Um, that's, you know, one of the most important things that I find for me is just approaching life, approaching every new thing that I take in with, how is this going to fit into, you know, my life plan. Uh, I'm definitely one of those people who has the 10 year plan. Sometimes that that's good for me. Sometimes it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't because it can tend to make you a little bit inflexible occasionally. But I really do like having that plan because it just lets me evaluate everything and, you know, uh, make sure that everything that I'm taking on fits in. And um, just a good way to balance everything is just to have your blocks of life that you try to keep separate. So when you're at work, you know, uh, when you're like a student leader, for example, especially try not to think about school, try not to think about friends when you're at work, like try to keep that time period just devoted to work. Same with school, if you're studying, turn off your phone so that friends or work can't reach you. Uh, that's, it's just really important to do both. Yeah. Oops, Jacob, I can't hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks. Classic Zoom moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so yeah, no easy answers. Um, you have to carve out blocks of time to do things. And, you know, that, that makes enough sense. What about, let me throw you a curveball. What happens with the student that's in college and working and their boss is more like, whenever you tell them that you need to study, they're like, oh, so you can't come in? You know, sometimes the employer doesn't always care about one's studies or something. So do you yeah. just leave them on red and just ignore them until you have time to deal with them or what? So it's interesting because I have been both on the receiving and giving end of this um, as a student leader myself, as a worker, but also as a boss at UTA, I, I have to deal with both of this. And I think that's the important thing is know what you're bringing to the table. So uh, know how to say no. That's something that um, I, I work with people who do not know how to say no and don't do it very well. And they are, I can tell you right now, I'm not gonna tell you who they are, but I can tell you that they are constantly burnt out 
that it is very, very hard for them to maintain their energy, that they always are stressed, and that often their, their stress makes this difficult on other people in the workplace as well. So learning how to say no to people is probably one of the most valuable things that you can ever learn. And you don't have to do it in a rude way. It's very important to learn how to say it respectfully, but you can you can even Google this. Like you can, there are, you can Google how to say no at work while not compromising your position or not compromising your relationships because people have looked into this. It's that hard to say no to other people, especially in the workplace. So um, that's just something that I would really encourage everybody here to, to learn, um, you know, compromise when you can say, yeah, you know, I, I'm happy to come in and work more on this day, but on this day, I really, I, I have an exam that I really have to study for, or I have another obligation at school that is, that is pressing today, but I'm really happy to work with you on this other day and do that. That's how you build up your professionalism. And that's how, you know, you make sure that you maintain those relationships. But like I said at the beginning, I've also been on the giving end of that. Uh, there was an event that I was running where I really needed backup for my team. And um, it was a, it was the first time I had done this event. So it was going to be new for all of us. And I needed some help passing out microphones to other students because it was kind of like an open forum style event. Um, well, one of my team members, she had a, a quiz coming up. She had a reading that was due the next day. And you know, she, we kind of had a little, a little moment where she was like, I don't think I can make it. And I said, I really would like it if you could, because so-and-so team member isn't coming either. And so-and-so team member isn't coming. Um, and it, you know, it was a, I think it was a moment that we both walked away from learning more about each other, learning more about each other's boundaries and respecting each other, because I had to keep in mind from training that this particular coworker of mine, when we were building our team, I uh, knew that she uh, gets very anxious if she doesn't have a long, long, adequate time to prepare for quizzes or exams. So I, it was on me to be respectful of that, to not give her a hard time afterwards, um, to, to remind her that next time I really would like her to be at this event, but the, prior, the prerogative was on me to try to find someone to replace her. So I can say that I, I understand the situation from both sides. I know what it's like to have to say no to people and do firm boundaries with them, but I also know, you know what it's like from the employer's side, and it's not going to be the end of the world if you have to tell them no, take it from me. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, great, great answer. Um, can I piggyback off that so what happens cause, okay so you as the employer the way you kind of understand that it's your duty to kind of balance this stuff you know so what happens when you because you're in a position of authority have to take the heat for something that goes wrong because obviously mm -hmm. that happens yeah yeah, that, that has happened a couple of times for sure. I can remember one time in a, a previous semester in which um, there were just really bad interpersonal conflicts in the branch that I was managing. So it was the student senate and student senators are, uh, they are fun people. They have minds of their own. They're all very unique characters and often that mix uh, creates some conflict and some conflict of interests. So um, you know, there was a time when I, for some reason or another, I just wasn't noticing a lot of these conflicts that were showing up. And I had to realize that that was on me because it was a conflict that was happening in the committee meetings. So I have, I was the speaker of the Senate and I had chairs under me that were in charge of their committees. And so I would kind of go from one committee to the next and kind of manage everything. But I was realizing that in one particular committee, it felt like as soon as I left it, things would start to go wrong and fall apart. And, you know, the chair was having troubles um, controlling his committee in, in a responsible way. So it um, that was an instance in which um, there ended up being some really hurt feelings between the chair and some of the members. And I had to kind of step in and listen to them and I think that is the key is just when people are hurt listen to them take the time to try to understand their point of view because as an employer you have to you have to humble yourself sometimes and you have to realize that kind of was on me I didn't really have enough oversight in this area I wasn't really watching to make sure you know he did his job correctly or that he had all the tools that he needed to manage his committee 
I kind of dropped the ball on this. So it was, it was a learning moment for me that some people need a little bit more oversight than others, and that's okay. Um, but it was also a time for me to kind of remind my members that like, yes, he was their immediate boss, but like, I'm also, you know, their, their boss too, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there for them. They can come to me, they can talk to me about these things. Um, yeah, it was, it was definitely a moment when, in which I, I practiced some of that active listening, that empathetic listening to uh, try to get to the root of the problem. And it was good for me to admit that I was wrong because then I could, that I could grow and improve from that. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's hard to, to make yourself like really, um, to, re, you know, to, to really look at your, you know, failures, not failures, but just, you know, challenges and stuff and try to work through those, you know, productively. Yes. Um, so let's, let's kind of move towards um, college success strategies. So beyond just budgeting time to, to devote to each thing, what other college success strategies do students like need to know before they hit the university? Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was thinking of this this morning as I was getting ready and, you know, a couple of things really stood out to me the most, especially, especially this morning because of recent uh, experiences that I've had personally, I want to say right at the beginning that college success is an ongoing experience. So some of this stuff I'm learning too. I'm in the same boat, but it's fresh in my mind because I'm learning it as well. And that's why I want to pass it along. So maybe some of you guys don't make the same mistakes that I did or that my friends made. Um, I, so two things that really stand out to me that I think a lot of students overlook. And I'm very surprised to hear that a lot of my, um, a lot of my classmates in college are overlooking this as well. A lot of my friends are too. And these two things that stand out that help your success are know that your professor 99% uh, of the time really wants you to succeed and is your friends. And that two, read your syllabus because it is shocking how many students don't read the syllabus. You as an instructor, I'm sure, are very familiar with that. It just astounds me to no end every single time because so many questions can be answered there. So many anxieties from the student can be alleviated. But, um, you know, on the topic of the first one. So let's say you are a really busy student leader. Let's say you got involved. Maybe you got a little too involved. You overcommitted yourself. That's okay. You can back down from that. But, you know, let's say that you are, maybe you're having a lot of difficulty in your classes. You know, maybe you, you underestimated her how difficult college was going to be. It's okay. It happens. I know incredibly gifted, smart people who have totally underestimated college. It happens. But you need to communicate this with your professor. Um, this semester, you know, it was, has been really hectic for me. I've been adjusting to my new role as student body president. Um, I've been getting ready to move and I've been planning my own wedding. So all of these things have been really, really hectic and busy. And I communicated that clearly to my professors at the beginning of the semester. And I've been kind of reminding them, giving them updates like, hey, this week is going to be particularly busy. I have this and that. Um, Professors aren't going to see that as you slacking off or you trying to make excuses, especially if you give them clear warning ahead of time. They'll actually appreciate that. Like in my experience, my professors have been extremely gracious. They've been accommodating. They've been um, you know, very understanding of my circumstances and how busy I am. They say, hey, it's okay. You know, we can catch up. We'll work with you on this. We'll work with you on that. And it gives me a lot of confidence to continue to work hard and succeed instead of giving up, you know, no one of my professors haven't hasn't been as flexible you know i'm the i'm i told him i was going to go on my honeymoon and then he said well okay just make sure that you tune in and watch the online lectures while you're gone and i was thinking well they're recorded so i, I you know i was thinking privately to myself they're recorded i think i'll probably just watch them on the weekend when i get back and you know not watch them on this very important occasion in my life but that's okay Every, all of the other professors have been extremely gracious. I'm probably going to write them all thank you notes at the end of the semester just because they've been amazing at working with me during this very unique time in life. And, and that's the thing is that, um, exactly, exactly. Like Chancellor Gerard says, notify your professors ahead of time and they're more likely to help you. They will appreciate it if you approach it professionally and if you give them uh, if you give them reminders way ahead of time, like I did at the beginning of the semester, hey, I'm getting married mid-semester, you know, I notified them ahead of time and then I reminded them too. 
And not only has that helped me succeed better in my classes this semester when they know what I'm going through, uh, but it, it's also kind of developed like a bond of empathy between us. And it's also helped us have another way to connect because they'll ask me like they'll they'll say like oh hey how how did your speech go that you were getting ready to do on thursday you know when you needed to be absent from class or how did um how did your bridal shower this weekend go so you know it's kind of cool because like i have that developing relationship with my professors over this semester it helps my mental health because it makes me happy you know i love making connections with people but it also just helps me alleviate my anxiety and stay ahead of things academically because I know that the professors are aware of everything and they really do want to help you. Um, and the other thing, the other thing that I mentioned, of course, read your syllabus. Um, a lot of times students have a question of, can I skip this class or not? You know, can I go do this? Or like, you know, even if you're a student leader and you have a legitimate excuse, I really need to attend this meeting. I really need to go, you know, give a speech like I did yesterday for Founders Day. You know, I really need to skip class for this because it's right during class time. So um, if you have a valid excuse, usually you can let your professor know ahead of time. But let's say you don't have a valid excuse. Let's say you, you just want to skip class and go have fun. That's it's important for your mental health as well to still have times to have fun during college. And it's just, you know, a fact of life, you need that. But check your syllabus and see, because here's the scary truth is that professors a lot of times will put down their attendance policies very explicitly. And the uh, a lot of times I find that the average attendance policy for professors is, uh, you know, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know what your attendance policy has looked like, but a lot of my professors say, I will provide three absences, you know, whether they're unexcused, excused or whatever, three absences, and then your grade starts dropping by a letter grade if you have more than three. That is kind of a, a universal thing. A lot of professors put that in place. Sometimes they differ and they have different attendance policies and that's fine, but like you, that is such a, such a sad way to lose a letter grade in a class. You don't want to lose a letter grade just because you skipped classes and you didn't realize that they were counting towards your grade. So make sure you read the syllabus, know your professor's expectations ahead of time, um, and just plan ahead. Use that syllabus. Print it out if you need to so that you can access it easily. Just have it on hand. Know what the professor's expected. Um, yeah, I, I can confirm basically everything you said in in my experience, um, most as, as a student, it was like, okay, if I've missed five or six days, I need to, you know, expect my grade to be lower, you know, mm -hmm. and I've done that calculation. It's like, okay, so that's seven points. Okay. You know? Um, so yeah, that definitely happens. Some professors are more lenient than others, as you've said, especially when it comes to like the blended aspect of college. Mm -hmm. Um, so could you speak briefly about, in your experience, how maybe online learning might change the dynamic, maybe because mm -hmm. professors aren't as accessible? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I have seen online learning, in-person learning, uh, both of those instances be re either really good or really bad. Um, and I think the challenge with online learning is that you mentally check out because when you are learning online, you have a horrible work-life balance and you have horrible like life and school balance because your the rest of your life bleeds into your school. Like, you know, you, you cook your breakfast while you're listening to your class and you don't really end up listening to your class. We have all had that experience, I'm sure, over the past year. I know I did personally as well. It's that's the important thing to remember, especially once you go to college and some some classes are you know, some classes are synchronous now and they have like the, the lecture running so people can attend online while some students can attend in person. That can be really helpful for your flexibility. If you have to work on something else while you're in the class, if it's an emergency, you can, but it's a pattern that you don't want to get into. You want to try to go to class in person as much as possible because I think online learning and online working, it really has changed the game in terms of our work life balance. And it's probably that's a phrase that you will hear me say over and over again work life balance, work life balance. The only reason I harp on that so much is because I used to have horrible work life balance. I, I am a, I am a recovering 
work addict. Okay. So I, I, you know, my idea of a day was, oh, you know, there's this many working hours in a day. If they are not all being used up for something, you are not being productive. I cringe, I cringe thinking about how I used to think that. That is horrible for you. That is horrible for your mind, horrible for your body, and horrible for your work. Because when you don't give yourself work-life balance, you won't work well. And unfortunately, I find that that's the case with a lot of online learning and a lot of online work is that you will, you will let life bleed into school, you will let school bleed into life, you'll let work bleed into life, and you really need to keep these things separate and distinct in order to have a really fulfilling and productive academic life. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it, it does. Um, yeah, because you can't be pulled between multiple things. Mm -hmm. it, it's really hard to be present in either. Um, so I completely agree with that. Um, let's, let's keep going with college a little bit. Cause I know that's what everybody is. I mean, that's the new frontier in everyone's life, you know? So let's talk about grades. The world is competitive. Um, is grades all there is, is knowledge all there is, is mm -hmm. there a way to have both? Yeah. Can you get neither, you know? Yeah. That's a great question. And the short answer to the last thing you said is, yeah, absolutely. You can, you can get, you, you can be getting great grades and you can be sitting in class and be learning absolutely nothing, especially if you find that you are someone who tends to coast and who finds all of this really dangerously easy. Um, I, you know, I think what you need to approach how you need to approach this is evaluate your life. And this is where having that life plan comes in handy. I know that can sound daunting, um, you know, or really picky. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to have every single step of your life planned out. But I would encourage you guys while you have time right now is to think about where you want to go. I don't know if you're taking career tests or not. I don't know if you're taking personality tests or not. Those are really helpful, but know where you kind of want to go, even if it's just in general, know your goals. Because when you have a specified goal, then you can define what success is for you. You know, because we, we, we're trying to think about this, like, do we, do, are good grades success? Uh, is an accumulation of knowledge success? Is having a really good resume success? And the thing is that this is not universal. There aren't universal markers for defining your success. You have to define that yourself based on what your life plan looks like and where you want to go. So for instance, if, you know, if your goal is to have a, get into a super competitive school, have a, you know, a, get really good SAT scores, ACT scores, whatever you take, you know, if that's your goal, then tailor make your life, you know, to that for now. So like focus on studying for that standardized test, focus on developing that college essay. But if you're just going to a college that's going to be near you, you know, then you don't, you don't have to be so honed in on that. You can take the time to develop your knowledge instead of your grades. You can take the time to just enjoy life, open your mind. You know, when I was at TCC, I had different goals then than I do now. My goals when I first started at TCC were to help myself adjust to college life out of high school. My goals were to love learning and treat myself to love learning and spend time learning success strategies while my course material wasn't as hard. So my, my success in those areas was definitely different than it is now. You know, my goals now are to, you know, really boost my grades and, you know, preparation for upcoming law school applications. So my goals are to, you know, get my grades as high as possible and to continue to boost my resume even though like I'm kind of uh weaning off on that now because you know it's 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 all right for now so I'm trying to focus more on the grade aspect and less on like doing more things because I'm doing enough right now so you know that that's a little bit of an example on how you need to reevaluate what how you measure success and what success means for you at every step of life we constantly reevaluate that and then once you find it go all in yeah. Um, okay. So the gr it's great advice and it's great advice because as you mentioned, it is a little challenging. It's almost existential. It's like define what you want, you yes. know, which is not exactly easy. Um, so let's, where I was going to go with is um, find a mentor, find someone that can help you. 
So how would you find a mentor? Mm -hmm. So um, a couple a couple of things that I'm doing right now, and one of these things um, I, I did a little bit backwards, but one way in which I would find a mentor is if you have uh, an honor society at school, uh, I would definitely try to join that. Now, here's the reason why this was flipped a little bit. I uh, at, at my university, uh, there's a professor at my university um, who is in my department. Uh, I knew her previously. She was actually my karate teacher when I was when I was growing up. So then I came to school and I was like, oh my goodness, wow, she's here. So what I did is I. You know, I knew a little bit about her academic history. Some of it overlapped with mine. And then I, I saw this, I saw her resume and I saw her history and I was like, okay, I have a previous connection with this person and their academic life, um, you know, kind of pans with mine, but she also married someone in the military. So she has experience with that. I also married someone in the military. So, you know, I was like, okay, so this person can help me, you know, give me advice for like multiple aspects of life. This is definitely someone that I want to continue a relationship with. That's all I did was I just emailed her and I said, hey, you remember me? Like I'm so-and-so, I would really love to, you know, go out for coffee sometime and talk about a couple of things. And then when you're, uh, when you're trying to spend some time with a mentor, it's important to have some like guided questions to ask them to like don't just come out of the blue and say help me with life because that's what we're thinking inside but like we need to kind of come up with a plan so like say hey I would really like to ask you a few questions about what it was like um adjusting to law school or I would really like to ask you a few questions about you know what um what was most helpful for you in finding topics to you know research when you started when you started going into the research field how did you define what you wanted to research you know just so just have some specific questions in mind when you're trying to contact a mentor when you're trying to build that relationship you know but um if, if you don't have a previous connection with anyone you can you know you start off with your professors. If there's a professor that you really like, talk to them after class. You know, mentor-like relationships, they can come out of anywhere. Just be alert, be alert, network with people and always be open to new possibilities. Always be open to meeting new people. And, you know, talk to your teachers. You talk to, talk to anyone who has a similar career plan or, a, you know, similar degree plan that you did. Because you as a student, we want to know what's coming up next. I want to know what's coming up next. I don't like to get caught off guard. I hate getting caught off guard. I hate surprises. So that's why mentors are so extremely important to me because I can search out someone who has kind of a similar life plan that I do. And then I can ask them, what are some steps that you took to get yourself here? Similarly, like when I'm going to events in which there's a Q and A, you know, a conference in which there's a speaker and they have an opportunity opportunity for questions. That is my number one question that I ask people. What are the career steps that led you to where you are? Because I love to see that step-by-step -step plan. It's so helpful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great answer. Thank you. Um, yeah. You'd be amazed how much stuff can go your way if you just ask, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and, and, and if I can provide my own perspective as a professor, I am more than happy to answer anyone's advice if they ask me a question. It's like, yeah. heck yeah, I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah, I'll tell you what I think. And we love um, it because like yeah. you're at that stage that, you know, you kind of paid your dues and it's great. Professors want, professors want you to ask them for help. They want you to ask them for advice. Yeah, and it also makes us feel important for yeah. sure. So <laughs> play into our egos by all means. <laughs> hey, at least you're honest about it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, I yeah. It, I saw that Chancellor Gerard asked, uh, asked a question on here and I would love to answer that because it's a really, really good one, uh, if you don't mind, Jacob. Yeah. Um, so it, it looks like he said, do you feel it is better for your academic life to do a few things well or many things to grow your resume? And that's a great question. Uh, I have a cousin in high school who I'm in the process of kind of guiding her through uh, her high school life as she prepares to transition to college, do her SATs, do volunteer work. And she's overwhelmed by all of these options that she has. And so one thing that I would like to say is, again, it really helps to know yourself here. If you know your plan, like if you are like, I want to do this, and then I want to do this, and then I want to do this. If you're like that type A person, 
that it's really important to do targeted things because the more, if, if you are a person who knows exactly where you're going, then the more diverse things that you do, the, the more potentially burned out you can be. If you are doing all these things that aren't related to your degree plan, your career plan at all, you're going to feel burned out. But total, on a totally other hand, if you don't really know what you're doing, that is one of the best things to do is to do a lot of different things to grow your resume because you can end up finding your life passion doing just something totally random. Like, for, like you volunteer, you know, for instance, you know, at, a, you know, Mission Arlington, for instance, or, you know, let's say you get to know their marketing director and you're like, oh, how do you, you know, how do you talk to donors? Like, how do you arrange events or something like that? And through that, you may find out randomly, like, wow, I have a, I have a passion for marketing and PR that I never knew that I had, you know? And so you can just find random passions here and there, like just realize that this is something that I wanted to do and I, I never knew I wanted to do it. And the only way you could potentially find that out is just by doing very things to grow your resume. So that's what I would suggest to you is again, know yourself. If you know exactly what you want to do, only do things that help build up that area of your resume and research how to build that up. If you don't know what to do, spread your wings, try all sorts of things until you find out what you want to do. I'm mute. And now I'm not, now I'm not. Is it, have you done any wacky jobs or known anyone that's done any wacky jobs in this process? Let me see. I mean, um, I, so it's not necessarily wacky, but I have, you know, I did have a lot of experience doing retail. Like when I was a, a tr when I was a transfer student, uh, not a transfer student, but when I was at, was at TCC, you know, I worked in a plant nursery for the longest time not related to my degree at all. I'm, I had a lot of people ask me there while I was working there, oh, are you studying botany? I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, you know, going to study PR in English. You know, I'm going to go to law school. I'm not, I'm not doing the whole botany thing. But it, you know, it taught me a lot about plants. So that's fun. But it taught me a lot about how to say no. It taught me a lot about how to, you know, react professionally to people. It taught me a lot about keeping my cool when people are angry and yelling in your face. Those are all skills that you need in various aspects of life. So really no experience is useless. If you have a lot of varied experiences, they may make you tired and they may make you burned out if they're not related to your degree plan, but they're not gonna be useless. You can learn something from anything. And I'm, many, many of my skills that I act that I actively use every day at work today, I learned through working in a plant nursery. I even had to I even had to like give talks there. So like they would have they would have times in which like they would have a you know a talks that I would have to give about look like, here's how you plant all these different plants or like here's how you landscape this or here's how you do that and you know I would have to give talks that was important for me not so that I could you know develop no knowledge of botany necessarily. But it was really important for me to practice public speaking in an environment in which I only had like 30 minutes to prepare. So it was, you know, I learned a lot of skills there that I use every day and that I wouldn't have known. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I agree. No, no work experience has been useless. Um, so they've all been informative. Some have taught me what I don't want to do, you know, <laughs> yes. which is which is absolutely necessary. Um yeah. So yeah, that, that again aligns with my experiences. So, so we're, we're getting close to the end. Um, I think we've probably got a time for a, maybe another question or two. Um, we haven't, we've talked a little bit about your leadership experience. Um, would you, do you have any, like a, a summary or anything you might want to tell the, the students about anything more about what it's like to lead a group of people? Because that's way different than just being part of a team. Exactly, exactly. Um, leading a group of people is an extraordinary experience. It's terrifying. Uh, be aware that it will put you in a lot of uncomfortable situations and be aware also that it will put you in a lot of extremely exciting situations that you never knew that you'd be able to be in. Um, I have had the opportunity to give a speech to, you know, about 2000 people at convocation. I've had the opportunity to speak at Founders Day. 
I've had uh, opportunities to, you know, help my school decide their budget, decide how they're going to spend a tuition increase for the next two years. Things that, you know, th things that affect all of the students around me. And I think one of the most important things that I've learned is to be adaptable, but to not let individual things shake you. Um, it's really important to practice stability in your personal life. So then when you're at work, you don't let things shake you. If you have instability and chaos in your personal life, then you will be more likely to get you know, riled up or upset at work. But I have had extremely upsetting situations happen to me at work, unfortunately. Um, I have you know, gone through situations in which I was bullied at work or you know, in which I was extremely anxious about dealing with a very difficult team member on a, on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And it's really hard to, it's, it's really hard to keep that up if you don't have stability at home and if you don't have stability in your personal life. Um, but just be ready to meet all sorts of people, be ready to do extraordinary things, just be ready to serve also, be ready to listen to people, walk alongside them. And, you know, when you're a student leader, it's just important to remember where you came from and remember kind of how honored you are to be in this position don't let it get to your head because I've seen that happen so many times with students who, the, the, as soon as they became student leaders, they became disconnected from the others around them and they became proud and it, it made them not very nice people to work with. Um, I do see a question on the side of how do you not let your personal life get in the way of school? And again, this is where those boundaries are so important, right? That's the number one word is boundaries. So it is hard and I hate to say it, but it's one of those things that you will just have to practice. So like maybe you need a ritual, maybe when you're heading out of the door and like something really stressful happened in your personal life or in school, head out the door. And if you need to take a deep breath and like consciously just let it go. Like if you, if, if you pray, you could pray about it. If you meditate, meditate about it. Just kind of think, okay, I got to let this go. I am going into work, just make a conscious effort to just set whatever that stressful thing was aside because it's not fair to your team members if you bring that to work. I work with people who have a very difficult time, as I said, with work-life balance. Um, I work with people who have a really difficult time with that. So they end up bringing in all these extraneous things into their, you know, into their workplace and it really bleeds into our team environment. It really makes it difficult for us to work with that person because they are just dealing with all this stuff at home that they're bringing into the workplace. And so I would tell this person, you know, um, just try to have better work-life balance. Pursue counseling if you need to, talk to someone outside of work, find someone outside of work that you can talk to about this stuff. And of course, I'm always there for you. I've told all this stuff to this individual, but, um, it's just, it's, it's one of those things that you have to make a conscious effort over and over again to set it aside and have, have a ritual for yourself if you need to, just to remind yourself to set it aside and have those separate blocks. It's hard. It's a constant battle, but it gets easier. I promise. It actually, it actually does get easier to compartmentalize. Yeah. Practice makes perfect, right? Yeah. Um, okay. We have three minutes left. Do you want to uh, briefly talk about your experience with PR and law? Yeah. Yeah. I saw that question right there. So, okay. So I'm going to be fully honest here. I have a lot more experience in, in PR than in law. So PR is a, is a degree that I've, I've talked to a lot of my professors and they say that it's a really good uh, entrance into law. So is English. So I'm kind of, you know, using those to try to build my foundation up to like English, English, for example, it's a really good to help. It, it's really good to help you prepare for the LSAT. It's actually one of the degrees that actually makes one of the top scores on the LSAT. So it's just good for, you know, learning how to be logical in your approach because most of the LSAT is, is it's logic, you know, it's logic, it's critical thinking, it's critical reading skills that all of those things are things that you need to know. So English has helped me a lot prepare for that. Otherwise, I don't have a, I don't have a lot of professional experience yet. Although I really hope to like get an internship in a law firm right after I'm done with this full student body president thing because that is all consuming. Do not try to do anything else while you are student body mm -hmm. president. But um, my uh, experience in PR, I, I have had a lot of experience in PR at work. So there are a lot of times in which I've even had people in the line at Starbucks try to get me to say bad things about a certain organization or about certain aspects of my job. People like literally in line for Starbucks, people trying to round me up, get a reaction out of me. 
the important thing is to think about everything that you're going to say. I know that sounds basic. Think about what you're going to say before you say it. That is really important. If you want to go into the PR field, um, you need to think about how everything that you're doing is viewed within all these different frameworks. And that can be really exhausting for someone who is not particularly, you know, bent towards that. That's why that's why companies hire P law representatives because they are the people who they they do not mind having a lifestyle in which they have to think of every possible alternative. I love thinking about every possible alternative. I really I really do. So, um, oh, I see a lot of questions here that I, I want to get to, and I know I know we're running out of time. I'm really sad about that. How, how about how about a very actionable step about? Um a leadership position and something that they could, we can touch on like in, in coming weeks, you know? Um, so like, do you think you could rephrase that a, a little bit different? Do you mean like how to pursue like a, a leadership position? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe something like that. Well, I, I mean, we're out of time. Um, <laughs> oh gosh. Could, could um, I follow up with you or sorry, go ahead. Yes, actually, and uh, if it's if it's fine, like I'm totally okay with sharing like my work email, like if anybody wants to follow up with that, because I really do, I really would love to answer some of these questions again. Um, these are really great questions. I wish we had time for those. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Then then yeah, we'll um we will circulate that. I'm sure. Um, yeah. So so I think we 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 are out of time, folks. Um, so I want to conclude this. Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. Um, this was a fantastic talk. And um, I look forward to um, just, you know, however you're going to be able to help these students as we go on. Yeah, so again, absolutely. thank you so much. Thank you, all of you guys. And I promise I will try to follow up and find a way to answer all these questions. I really want to answer those for y'all. But thank you so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Bye. Thank you, guys. Yep. Um, okay, folks, so I am about to end this. Um, yeah, please send your questions to back to parchment at Gmail and we will get them circulated to Caitlin. Um, if, there, if whoever else is still on this call, allow me to make those announcements. Um, so we do have a cover letter workshop next Monday at 5 p.m. It will be virtual. Um, and then students can also submit an application to become a parchment fellow. Uh, and get connected with the career mentor via this link. I'm about to post it in the chat, uh, but we will also post it again, basically everywhere. Okay, so here's that. Um, okay, folks, I'm good if y'all are. Thank you. <laughs>